Hello, everyone, and welcome to K6 Office Hours. This is my first time back this year. It's a little bit weird. I am Nicole van der Hooven, and I'm here with two of my colleagues. So you get three of us today. Hello. Um, oh, I'm oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, I should have this, said who yeah, goes I, first. I see how this session's going to go. Uh, Great start. Great start already. All right, you go first, Paul. Oh, okay. All right. I'm Paul <laughs> Baylog. <laughs> there we go. I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> and my name's Marie. You're uh, DevRel. You're uh, Browser DevRel. <laughs> you're your T6. And we wow. have Leandro. <laughs> we we have do have Leandro in the chat as well. So, so we're here. Um, that to, wasn't like, a great start. Or, yeah, we need to practice this. <laughs> we should here. have like the intro down pat. Yeah. But today we are going to talk about how to organize test scripts. And as soon as we started talking about it, we realized that it really depends what you use your tests for. Because K6, even though it started as a load testing tool, really it it's a it's evolved to be a lot more um, a lot more versatile than that. And so there's a bunch of different kinds of testing, and each one of us has gravitated towards a specific kind. And we're going to show off some ways, some some different options for you to be able to organize your test scripts. But maybe let's talk about why it's even important to organize test scripts. I'll go first this time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm so scared now to speak in case. Um, yeah, I think for me, the main reason is uh, reusability and, um, you know, it's much easier to read. So um, to me, like, if I want someone to read the code that I've written, so it's not enough that the code works, it should also be, you know, easier to understand. It should also be easier to extend because at the end of the day, um, it's part of the development code. So it should be treated the same way as if you're, you know, writing development code. Um, so to me, maintainability and reusability is like really key. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Uh, readability is, that's huge, you know, to be able to uh, make sure that people can, you know, that somebody other than yourself or your future self can uh, come back to a project and then uh, yeah. see that and then uh, understand, you know, how, how it's, you know, how everything's structured, how it all works. And then just also too, you can use it for uh, like uh, some of the things that I do with some of my integration tests. I want to have the output be nice and structured in a, uh, you know, nice readable way. In uh, if we're capturing the log output, uh, that type of a thing. So, lots of different uses. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you both, and I also think that it's um, if you organize your your test scripts, then that means that it's a lot easier to modularize them too. And that's important because as much as possible, we don't want to be writing, we don't want to be copying and pasting the same code into different places. Because then when you change one, then you have to change it everywhere. And that's just a pain. So yeah. it, it, some of these scripts can be quite long, <laughs> which we will be demonstrating later. And um, I think it's very unwieldy to have like this really long script that you have to scroll through. How are you supposed to find out when when you have to change something in there, especially if you weren't even the one that wrote it to begin with? It's easy if um, things are kind of separated. Yeah. But I guess maybe we could start with with Marie with browser testing. Yeah. So um, should I just yeah share my screen and go for it? Get, get started. All right, so I'll share the link to, maybe I should have started in um, sharing the uh, GitHub project link, but this is actually available um, in, on my public GitHub repo. So this might actually like look familiar already for people who are used to browser automation. So um, the angle that I want to uh, demonstrate today is, you know, we can easily adopt like popular design patterns such as the page object model within our uh, K6 test, especially if you're trying to use the um, XK6 browser extension. So this sort of folder structure might already seem familiar uh, to people. So um, 
if, for example, I'm using a lot of data, um, I will have a you know typical data folder where you know I will store the data that I need so that I don't have to keep on you know typing them. Um, pages. So again, this is quite useful, especially if you're going to interact with um, different pages as part of your browser test, especially if you want to verify different user journeys, then um, rather than having all the pages in a single class, you know, some of these um, actions can be created into like different functions. Um, then it's just, you know, a, uh, a popular uh, design pattern is to have this uh, page object model where you can have a um, a uh, different class for each of the different unique pages, or you can have different classes for uh, different components as well. So um, probably the way that I'm going to start is I'm going to just demonstrate the um, application that I've, um, that I've um, opted to automate. So this is uh, Mark Winteringham's Rustful Booker. Uh, platform. If you're part of the Ministry of Testing community, then you know this is quite um, increased the font size. I will definitely do that. Hopefully, this looks better. Cool. Um, so this is like quite a popular, um, you know, test application because you can also do API testing. You can do UI testing. So this is why I've chosen this uh, for this demo. Um, so essentially. Um, what I wanted to, you know, um, automate is um, this piece of functionality where if a user submits a new booking, um, how can we automate that um, by having a browser script uh, using XK6 browser? So the way I've done that, and um, I've created um like different has for it because i was experimenting with like different options to do it with k6 but ultimately um i've ended up with two tests that i want to show you so first let's just focus on uh this booking new test so um looking at the different imports so you can see here that i've added different import statements from the uh, different pages that I've created. And if I just quickly open, let's say the home page, because this is the part uh, that uh, I've shown in terms of the booking form. So again, if you're familiar with um, with Java or you know in JavaScript, they do have a way of uh, using import and export um, and then adding a constructor to initialize um, your uh, code. So I've just, you know, decided to use that approach. So in here, I've got a constructor. And when this class gets um, initiated, then it will pretty much um, initialize all these different variables. So I'm using page.locator to find the element um, that I want to interact with. And um, this is actually the first time I'm demonstrating um, the async uh, functionality. So um, if you look at the um, GitHub project for XK6 browser, we haven't fully released it yet. But if you want to you know, experiment with the async await keyword, you can just pull um, the, um, the latest uh, sort of uh, binary from our main branch. And you can try the async await um, functionality, but we'll be releasing this uh, quite soon. So that's, I guess, a separate announcement uh, that we just, you know, want to share. Uh, but yes, so in here, I'm I've created like different, you know, uh, methods for each of the unique actions. So let's say if I want to visit the home page rather than typing, you know, this URL quite a few times, I just have my go to function. And similarly with my submit form, um, I also have a dedicated function for that. And in terms of the data, again, this is um, easily abstracted. So let's say someone is new to your project and they just easily want to um, modify any of the data that you have, then rather than changing it from like different areas, they can just go ahead and change it um, in one class. So again, that reusability and that maintainability. 
Cool. So um, going back to the actual tests, um, so you can see here that um, once I've imported all the different um, classes that I actually require, I'll talk about this test setup later um, and I'll explain why I have this. But the idea with um, K6 is we have this life cycle sort of feature where anything that's within the default function, we call this like the virtual user code. So this is the code that our virtual user um, executes again and again, depending on the uh, number of views or the number of like iterations that you have specified. Um, but uh, in here, so rather than, I guess, having all the logic in terms of, okay, I want to go to a page, I want to type all these different um, values into the different fields, I'm just calling the different methods. And um, it's much easier to understand this way as well. So you can see that, yep, I'm creating a new instance of homepage. I'm going to that homepage and then I'm submitting the form. And then I'm expecting that, okay, the verification message should at least contain my name to basically check that, you know, everything is working as expected. And I've done the same thing on this different uh, page called the admin panel. Um, basically, the idea of uh, the test that I um, have is after they have submitted the form, they can then go to this admin panel, they can uh, log in, and then they should um, basically verify that the message um, have been like um, added, you know, successfully. So at the moment, my message isn't there, but maybe we can, you know, run this test and uh, see what happens. So... Okay, let me just um, quickly run the test as well, and then I'll 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 I'll, I'll explain like the other um, areas. But like you can immediately see already how this is much easier to read. It's much easier to understand, and everything is like differentiated into different classes, into you know different I guess like um, like functions as well. So everything has a clear responsibility um, of you know what's like going on. So let me just quickly run that test. Oh, <clears throat> looks like the demo went well. Um, <laughs> Always a good thing. Yeah, Whew. that's the difficult uh, part done. <laughs> so yeah, you can see here that um, all my assertions are passing as well. Um, and you might notice that this is quite different from the um, existing check function uh, that we have for K6. And because um, I'm actually using the K6 JS library for my assertion, um, we've discussed this in a separate uh, K6 office hours, but like to me coming from like a browser uh, test perspective, uh, and I'm so used to using, you know, uh, Mocha and ChaiJS. Uh, so transitioning this to K6, I was really happy that there is a library dedicated for like Chai support for K6. So I ended up just reusing the expect library as well. So you can see here that I'm using uh, three expect assertions, and again, they're also um, easier to read. Um, one thing that I want to share, so I mentioned that within the K6 lifecycle, we have uh, different functions. So we have um, a setup function. So this is basically like your initializing code. Um, and the main reason why I have this is um, I want to be able to have my browser test in a state where um, it doesn't have any dependencies on existing messages, on existing data. So I want to make sure that I've cleared um, the UI in a state that I want it to be. So this is actually a great combination of um, showing how API and how a UI test can work together. So I guess I can just quickly open the um, setup code. 
And this is just, um, and this might not be like the best way to do it, but it works. Um, so in here, I'm just um, basically getting all the different existing messages um, in terms of, you know, what's been actually um, sent to the database. And I'm just filtering the messages that actually contains my name. And if there are any, then I want to um, basically log in to the application so I can delete those existing messages under my name. So this is just so that I can avoid um, multiple instances of my messages coming through. So I just want to really click, you know, the one message. So this is why I've added um, a delete script uh, as part of my setup. We um, have a question from yeah. Kale Diello, if you don't mind. Yeah. They say, uh, questions for browser level K6 testing. If I would like to integrate into CI CD in cloud instance, instead of running a local browser, how does that work running the same test in an EC2 instance? Mm -hmm. So um, I guess this is where, you know, because at the moment um, I'm running it um, with a browser, so it's not headlessly. So we do have the default option of running your test headlessly as well. So this is, um, like perfect for those instances where you want to integrate it as part of your CI CD environment. So you just need to um, not pass because I think if I just quickly um, go back here. So there is an option here called headless false. So by default, this is set to true. So if you run this as part of your CI CD, then it shouldn't require um, an actual browser because it should run your test headlessly. Uh, hopefully, I've answered the question. Yeah, I think so. I think it's part of the protocol as well. I think it's it's part of dev tools that they allow you to run headlessly. So um, you don't actually need to open up a browser instance. It's just nice to see <laughs> for demos. Um, another question, where can I try out the async feature? I believe it's not in version 0 0.31 yet. Yeah, so if you go to XK6 browser, so again, this isn't um, like fully released yet. So we're still on version 0 0.70. However, um, if you pull the latest main, so we do have, let me just go to our installation guide. Just a clarification too, because KL said version 0 0.31. This is mm -hmm. not core K6. Yeah. Marie is showing XK6 browser. Just yeah. in case you're wondering why the difference. The versions, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't match. We went backwards. <laughs> you know, that's what threw me yeah. off is that way. We're on like 42. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, KL, if you go to our um, installation guide, so um, this line here, if you add the keyword at main, so maybe we'll write that down as part of um, the chat so it's much easier. Um, so that will actually create a um, custom binary of K6 using the main branch of XK6 browser. So this is how you can try out the async await. Um, or, you know, if you can wait, uh, it's going to be released as part of our next release. So hopefully in the next um, month or so. Well, that, that is the target, uh, yeah. like Feb. So Yeah, I think yeah. for K6 Core, uh, the release target is uh, February 20th for uh, 0 0.43. So yeah, yeah, you can use that uh, that main to have the latest and greatest and hopefully stable. Not, not guaranteed. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely not guaranteed. Um, I, I, uh, well, the team have found, you know, issues as well, because this is the first time that we are supporting um, async await. Um, historically, K6 API is, you know, synchronous, but because with X K6 browser, there is the need to support asynchronous operations so that whenever we visit a new page or whenever we click, you know, a button that causes page navigation, we have to wait for that uh, operation to finish so that we avoid any race condition. So because of that, we have found like several issues. Uh, for example, you might have noticed that um, I couldn't really demonstrate using uh, groups um, within, you know, 
um, in terms of like organizing my tests because at the moment we do have outstanding issues uh, in terms of the async await support for you know groups. Um, but what I can demonstrate is um, oh there is a question again. Um, so KL is um, asking is there a way to hook up K6 browser extension with Google Lighthouse? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, I don't think there is uh, a way. However, we have plans to uh, implement the core web vitals uh, soon. So we plan to um, have it align with what Google Lighthouse is also reporting. Um, one of our developers in XK6 browser has created a POC already. So it's just a matter of uh, implementing the actual work. So it is coming soon as well. Awesome. Me, yeah. Let me just take a break because my throat is <laughs> itchy. <laughs> sure. Um, did you want me to go keep going with back end <clears throat> stuff? Um, I, I, I wanted to show one last thing. Sure. I think the multiple scenario um, is a really cool feature. Right. Let's yeah. A minute. So um, in the past, it, a6 Office Hours episodes, we have been talking about this hybrid approach um, to performance testing. So I also just want to quickly demonstrate that. Um, so with the use of scenarios, and Nicole will also talk about scenarios. So let's say you want to um, have a scenario where you want to run two separate UI tests, and at the same time, you want to run a protocol level test, uh, then you can easily achieve that. Uh, by using scenarios um, within K6. So the way I've done it, so if we look at this booking um, scenario and the login scenario, so if we look at our functions uh, for those, um, I've separated the booking form as well as the admin panel login as two separate functions to keep it more modular. So this um, booking function here, so this function's uh, responsibility is just to submit the form and then the login, which is a separate one, it's basically just logging in uh, to the admin panel and just making sure that, you know, that the logout button is there, just like a quick check to see that you have successfully logged in. So while I have these two uh, browser functions, um, at the same time, I also have this protocol level function that I've called uh, messages. So imagine um, you want to put your system in a scenario where you want to send like 10 or more uh, different bookings and you want to see um, how your system, you know, will be able to handle that. But at the same time, you also want to see what's happening uh, in one browser. So what's, ha what's happening in the UI if a user submits a single uh, form. So in terms of my scenarios here, I have uh, three concurrent um, um, three, uh, three concurrent scenarios that I want to execute. Um, just for the simplicity of this example, I've set everything to one, but you know we can easily set this to however view or you know how many iterations you want. Um, but just to quickly demonstrate how this runs. So if I just quickly run that test. And you're going to see that there's uh, three different scenario. One is doing the admin. Another one is doing the booking. And then we have another one here. But you can't really see because it's in the protocol level. That's, you know, doing the, um, you know, the, um, like the protocol level test. And you can see here that, you know, all three um, have run concurrently. Um, and you've got this aggregated view of the different metrics. Um, and one thing that you can, you know, build on top of this is, let's say you want to even um, have a way of, you know, viewing the different, I guess, browser performance metrics on the different pages. So I wanted to show the concept of how you can use, um, like, you know, basically group it by the URL, but I didn't have the time. So hopefully Nicole can then show how, you know, she can use tags or she can use groups to basically have uh, those like separation. 
but yeah i think this is like a great demonstration of like trying to execute different um tests into you know a much more um easier uh to understand oh my notes and you could see here as well that in terms of the data i've reused the data i'm not you know um hard coding it multiple times so if i need to change anything i just need to actually go into the class that i want to update so yeah organize your test groups <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. There's a lot of things that are different from how I did it and a lot of things that are the same or similar. Yeah. All right, let me share what I did. Okay, so I think, well, I guess before that, um, I wanna talk about some of the differences between you know, backend testing and browser or end-to-end -end testing. I think that one of the main ones is that very often, at least, browser testing, when people say that, sometimes they mean end-to-end -end testing, so it's within a flow. Like you start from one step and then you go through to the other. The thing with load testing or backend testing is that often that doesn't matter. I'm not saying you can't do end-to-end -end testing on the back end. You absolutely can, just not depends on what, where you define, you know, the start and the end. But um, a lot of times, for example, at Marie's tests or, or browser automation tests might need to go to every single product page to make sure that everything's loading. As a load tester, that's not my main concern. I kind of my tendency, unless there's a different um, requ requirement, is to make sure that all product pages are lumped together so that, because, and the reason for that is I tend to think of things by component. Like all of those product pages are probably hitting the same components, whether it's product A or product B, it doesn't really matter. It's probably being kept in the same database and it's the database that I want to test. So I think that'll be a little bit um, clearer when I show what I did because I saw that Marie was using, was separating things by pages. Hang on, let me actually add it. And I actually, I, I did it, this is a home page, but as you can see, I also have cart and product and each one has different pages within them. So for example, like the cart one might have view cart and checkout. That's because I'm trying to group them by function, like by, by area. I'm thinking that everything to do with the cart might be in, in about the same set of components. So like logically that makes sense for me for the kind of test that I'm doing. So for example, with homepage, um, if I go here, you can see that I am mainly using functions to group things. And that's because a lot of load testing tools use functions as well, use some sort of transactions. When I first joined K6, I kept saying transaction. K6 doesn't have something called transaction. And I learned that that is a very specific term for load testers because a transaction doesn't mean a request. A transaction could be an action. It could be a page. It kind of loosely depends on, on what you're testing. But in other tools, this might be um, like for, for JMeter, it could be a controller or it could be a thread group. So in K6, I think that the best, um, the thing that approximates a transaction the best is a function because then you can do things like just call the home page or, or later on we'll see, um, here's a sneak peek later. So here, this is what it's going to look like. So there's a setup, there's a teardown, and then there are things in between. And each scenario could be different. Maybe I don't need this for everything. So like this one is the purchase one. So if I go to the other scenario, it just has going to the home page, viewing the product, and think time because think time is so um, it's really important in in load testing to get that right as well because it's part of the the load profile. And so I have a separate function for that. Another thing um, is that Marie mentioned grouping URLs. And that's also relevant because it's not like in browser testing where you really just have to script the user interactions. In backend testing, you have to be, you're essentially making up for the browser, for all the requests that a browser knows to make when you just click on a button. So 
this is a lot, okay, but I wanted to leave it in here. All of these are embedded resources for a single page. And while I'm scrolling through this, you can see this is why I separated this into its own script. So not just by function, but this is the only thing that's on here because there's no way I'm going to scroll through all of that and have multiple times that for every single page. So this is why I also grouped it. Now the thing with groups is that it does affect the response time that's reported. So if you are specifically looking for just the response time of this one HTTP request, then you shouldn't group it because um, this group will include the response time of, of like how long it takes to download everything on that page. So it's not always the best idea, but it is sometimes. Um, Ellie Bariki John is asking, Nicole, can you share the Git repo? Yes. Thank you for reminding me because I actually meant to start with that and did not. So I'm sharing it now. Um, okay. And so I also showed you earlier that I have a setup and teardown. I actually didn't get to that part, <laughs> but I, I just do have some things here. Uh, Marie touched on this as well, where she talked about maybe having to delete data that's generated by the test, and then the setup is like initializing the test and setting up data. So if you're used to load runner or something like this, that's this is our equivalent of vuser init and vuser end. So this is a lot, this um, kind of structure is a lot more familiar to load testers, because we don't do it by step. Um, what else? Oh, so I talked about the URL grouping. Now, I also want to show how I used tags. So I'm going to go to the, to the product page before I show how I put them all together. The problem with the product page is, as I said, in this, in this case, I just put them together regardless of what product is selected. So there's some randomization for which product this is, but I don't really care whether it's the beanie or the hoodie. I just want to know in general, when you go to a product page, how long does it take to load? So here I used just a, a tag that just calls it a product page regardless of what this is. Because if, if I don't do that, then I'm going to see each request individually. And maybe that's useful as well. But I also wanted to see kind of like a group. Now, you might be wondering what the difference is between groups and tags. They both affect um, response time. Well, the groups definitely affect response times. But tags are set on a per request level. So when you have a group, you, you put them all together. Like everything has to be within that group. But when you tag something, they could be in completely different scripts even. So you can have one tag that's in the product um, script and then another, and the same tag that's in another script, like the homepage script. And so you could do this to, for example, if you're, if you're more concerned about videos or like video streaming or um, maybe you want to tag all assets, uh, images and JavaScript and whatever. So you can do that across functions, across scripts. So this is what I've got for the individual kind of components. This is how I'm putting them together. So I called it scenario one. This is the purchasing scenario. And this is how to import those other scripts into this one. So now I'm importing all of these functions and it, they're not actually defined here because they're coming from those other scripts. This is what I was saying earlier about modularizing so that you, you only have to call that from the other scripts. And um, then in this one, I was thinking this might be one where a user goes from start to finish and purchases something, but this one is just a browsing one. And what if you want to run them together? Well, you also can by abstracting it out a little bit. So I can also show you, this is like kind of the baseline test. I called it UC because sometimes these are called use cases. Sometimes they're called epics or, I mean, the convention changes quite a bit. But in this one, um, I am also using different scenarios like Marie did, like Marie showed. And now I have different, um, different, scenarios like these, this one and two that I'm showing here. Uh, hang on, I think we have some questions. Okay, let me just check. 
uh, okay. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but I'm going to give it a try. Grzegorz Pajnik. <laughs> sorry. Grzegorz. I'm sorry. I <laughs> Are you planning to add annotations in the above groups or tests to be able to group them by priority? You can, that's kind of, I think that might've come before I, um, I showed the scenarios. Um, you can add annotations. I like to have them as the actual title of the, of the script. And this can be useful for requirements traceability as well. If there are certain scenarios that you need to be ticked off and you have to link them to certain requirements, then it's just easier to have it as a file name than to just than to have it within the test. Um, Rose says, I'm currently load testing a backend API, but my modularization has led to having a lot of imports at the top of the script. How do you avoid this? You can't. I think it's okay to have the imports. Um, yeah. I, I yeah, I, it's just it's just something that you are going to have to deal with, unfortunately. Paul and Marie, do you have any other ways around this? Uh, I I don't. I think like this is one of those things that yeah, like you have to you know choose which one. But I think this is actually much better than not doing the whole modular modularization at all. But what I've seen other teams, what they've done is they uh, they sort it by like alphabetical, so at least it's easier you know to remove things or add things. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I just, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just usually rely on my IDE to collapse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not so quite in your face, but, uh, or you could always have another file that has all your imports that you import yeah. one single import into your main script. So. Yeah. I think that's what <laughs> that's, uh, Leandro was Yeah, yeah asking, Leandro yeah. was just saying too. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's yeah. ways around it, but yeah. Okay, and then I also want to share something, but wait, another question. What would be the relevance of load testing in cloud environments like Azure, where resources can be spun up on the fly to handle load surges? Also, test environments test tend to be vastly different from production environments due to cost constraints. Okay, so kind of a two-part question there. As to the first part, um, this is a very common question, and the answer is that you can test the the elasticity itself. You can test whether or not that's working as you expect. And there are a lot of configurations, so it, it's not just that it can scale infinitely. And if you think it can, you might be in for some harsh surprises. And um, I think it's always a good idea to test for that. And then it's always like, well, which ones scale infinitely? Because maybe you generate so much load in your application, but the end result is sent by email and it's your email server that goes down. So there's a lot of things um, that that you have to consider when you're scaling something up or down. It's difficult to just rely on infinite scaling. There's also the the question of, are you sure that none of the none of the connections are lost or none of the data is lost when things scale up or down? Or how long does it take to scale up or down? What, what are the costs associated with it? So there's still a lot of things to test there. As for the second part with test environments being vastly different from production environments, absolutely. I think there's a value to, to doing even performance testing in test environments. It's easier in the long run to test as early as possible. You've probably heard that. But I also think that you can't really say that a, that a production environment will definitely behave the way a test environment did. If you can't have like a pre-production environment or a performance testing environment, test in production, not the same way that you would test in a test environment, but there's still definitely performance tests that you can do, but, you know, just start more carefully, maybe do like real user um, monitoring first and then, or maybe a handful of users like synthetic monitoring and then kind of scale up as you go. Yeah, definitely increment it as you learn, you know, what, what the tipping point is so you don't hit that tipping point <laughs> and yeah. bring down production. <laughs> I also just wanted to show what those um, results look like. Okay, so this, this test actually didn't do so well <laughs> um, because 
I ran into some resource issues, but what I wanted to show was what the tags and groups look like. So here you can see that I've got two product pages and then another page product here. So I just wanted to show, oh, by the way, the first thing is first tip, you'll see this by default and you still get everything separated out by URL. But as you can imagine, I mean, this was a quick demo and it's like four pages of stuff already. So this is why I group, because it's not just about grouping within the script. It's also about what that'll look like in your results. So quick tip, flip over to tree and you'll see it nice and grouped. So this page product, this is a, this is a group and you'll see that there's all of the different kinds of, of products that are in there that I've tagged as belonging to the product category, what, however you would define that. So this is why it's handy to be able to group because these are the entire pages. So that's why even the assets are being shown there. However, I also did a tag for just the product, just the product request, that initial one. And that's why these are showing up as well. And the reason that there are two of them is because they're grouped by status code. So why is it a 301 and sometimes it's a 200? Well, you know, that's, that's, that bears further investigation, I think, that's worth investigating further. It's also different response times. Um, and I want to leave Paul some time. So, <laughs> Paul, over to you for your stuff. All right. Yeah. No, let me uh, go ahead and, uh, well, I guess I won't share my screen just yet. Or will I? Yeah, I will. Hold on. <laughs> I'm a little out of it today. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> You're yeah. good. Yeah, no, I'm, I think I'm going to go take a nap after uh, immediately when we're done with this. But uh, now, so I, here I'm showing kind of like, uh, uh, I'm creating an integration test in this case. So here I was working on the XK6 Kubernetes uh, plugin or extension rather. And then I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, the API changes that we were making were still working. So what I did was I have it so that I can actually run this little local Kubernetes environment. And then I just run the current build through this, uh, this process just to make sure that uh, all the code is working. So this one, it's, it's very procedural. And I'm going to show you like uh, both, uh, both uh, ends of the spectrum, really. So this is one that is very procedural. I didn't break it up into separate functions like, <laughs> like Nicole did. I'm not, uh, you know, this isn't how I would code something in code, you know, the way you break things apart. It's, that, it's the, the dry principle. Do not, don't repeat yourself. But uh, in this case, it's very procedural. So it's just step by step by step by step by step. And I was using our Chai JS, uh, the JavaScript module, because I, I wanted this output to be nice and, uh, you know, very structured, um, you know, behavioral driven development output. Um, so let me go ahead and just go ahead and run this script real quick and just show what the output looks like. And I guess I could have just scrolled up because it was still there from before. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll look through here. So I'm using, I'm just simply using these describe sections just to be able to output something nice here as I'm going through each one of these steps. So that way then if any one of them failed, it's, you know, blatantly obvious what was wrong. So, you know, it's, this was just, it's, it's a tool for me. It's not, you know, to do a load test or anything. This is just a quick little integration test just to be able to see, you know, uh, ensure that the code I'm changing is still working, you know, that I haven't degraded anything. So um, I do have that out there. This is just in the XK6 Kubernetes. Um, I guess we could throw that if anybody is interested in it. Um, here's the specific file as well. Um, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward, nothing fancy. Again, uh, this was just for a tool for me to go ahead and make sure that the code was working before I would, you know, actually hit merge and, and push it up into a, a, a you know, an official release or something. So that's, that's one. So this is kind of like, I would consider the simple, you know, straightforward procedural. Now, this one is not one from us, but this is actually from GitLab. So this is the complete opposite spectrum. So this is like, uh, you know, breaking things apart to the maximum. 
So GitLab performance team has this, uh, this tool that they've created. Now they've actually gone way out there where they have it written in Ruby, where they, um, they will basically control K6 and put together custom options where they have all these things. Now I'm not going to go into the Ruby code and, you know, they have all these different command line options where they can say, oh, okay, test for, you know, a scenario with 25,000 users, that type of a thing. It's, it really gets pretty complicated what they have, but it's impressive. But if you look at the, the organization of their project, um, here, and let me uh, again uh, find uh, share the link to their source code. Um, again, it's GitLab. All right, but uh, yeah, so this is this is very complicated. So again, they have a custom Ruby script that is actually taking command line options and it's building together this large uh, um, the all the options for uh, overall test. So this was. It's actually something I thought about uh, trying to mimic with uh, some of the things like with the uh, with the uh, disruptor or something like that. This would be actually pretty cool. But if we take a look at these, these are their overarching. These are their main entry point uh, uh, scripts here. So if you look here, they keep it to a minimum um, as much as possible. So they're doing these uh, checks against repository branches and things like that. But then they're using all these imports. So they'll bring in all the, the scripts from other areas. So here, like uh, based on, again, this is all like command line options. So they would say that they want, I think in this one, uh, an environment for 10,000. I think that might be users on this one. But then they have all these that'll pull in the different options. So again, this is like, it's it's kind of crazy. It's It's very cool but they build together this uh, dynamically generate this one single JavaScript, essentially that they're going to run through K6, you know? Um, so again, this is the absolute, you know, complete opposite of what I had with the small procedural thing, but uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. I, uh, anybody that's doing a lot, this might be a good uh, template for uh, looking into, you know? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm not going to actually run any of these because I don't have anything stored. These are tied to their Git, their, uh, I guess, the equivalent of GitHub actions. So this is in their build process. They can actually use their CI CD to call using this product and then it'll build together the command line. So it's it's pretty, pretty cool. I don't have any way to really show you uh, how it works when it runs. But uh, again, this is a this is a complicated complicated one so i have a way to for them to see because we had grant young from gitlab on on k6 office hours so he actually demonstrated it live and yeah he sees the same person who wrote the script that paul was sharing yeah, nice. yeah it's it's pretty impressive it's uh it's <laughs> it's pretty <laughs> wild <laughs> But yeah, but that was that was it. Short and sweet for me, anyway. Okay, I did want I did have some questions as well. Like, was there anything that you would have done? I mean, obviously, okay. Well, I, I don't want to speak for you, but I did this like just before, just before <laughs> office hours. So I definitely don't want to say that this is like the best way to do it. I feel like there was more I could have done that I didn't do. How about you too? Yeah, it's the same for me. Um, like I created the repo two days ago, but I don't know. I just decided to also make some last minute changes, like <laughs> two minutes before we uh, we did the office hour, because I wanted to also demonstrate that you can execute two browser tests in parallel at the same time. Uh, I wanted to showcase like that you can maybe also group it by the URL, but I didn't have the time, so. Um, I guess the sort of like main thing that I want to um, point out is there are different use cases and there's not necessarily one or like the best way. So it's just however, like what your requirement is. So you just have to really, you know, select like all the different, I guess, parts that make sense to you. So in some cases, um, scenarios, it might not be the um, one that you prefer. It might be the group or it might be the... Uh, BDD format using the describe and 
um, expect from K6JJ. So it's just really cool to, you know, provide all these different options and just shows that, yeah, K6 is now more than just a load testing tool, really. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting that you both um, did it in a very like step based approach. I guess it's just with load testing. Yeah, it's very procedural, right? But but um, normally back end testing is what you like. The way that I showed is what would be generally driving the load more than you know browser testing or the integration tests, right? So yeah. I think just with a sheer amount of data. I think it matters less what the exact flow was as long as the levels of load are still what you would expect from production yeah. or what, or from a certain circumstance in production. Um, so that was interesting to see. And for me, I didn't even put thresholds. I would absolutely put thresholds. Yeah. That is super important. Um, I didn't even touch on that. I think with load testing, better error handling is even more important because you are almost certainly going to get some load-induced errors. If you are uh, trying to break something, you probably will, you know. So um, what I would have liked to do was to script around it. That's what I would do in like a real project. I would look for real error messages that I see. So I'd run the test and then um, manually go through the site and specifically look for those because it's one thing to just say, yep, that's another error. And it's another thing to say, no, I got the specific error again like hey maybe yeah. it was a Cloudflare error um, so that's something that you you want to be able to separate out I'd also want better data handling um, because with load testing having states of data is sometimes really important and that's not something that I would try to do just from the script what I would ideally like to set up is have like calls to Redis or something to so mm -hmm. push to some sort of database uh, what state it's in and then the next iteration or the next type of script can go in and pull data from certain columns from that database as well. Um, I know Paul kind of like cheated because he showed what he couldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I both like, <laughs> I both like think that um, that was a cheat and also I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking the same right. thing. Yeah. <laughs> No, but uh, but yeah, as far as to uh, as far as like what I would have improved though on the the thing that I that I did show, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so like that integration test, you know, that was for Kubernetes, and that was for one specific type of resource. If uh, for those that follow that, it was for ingresses. Now that same script, that process, because uh, I was following the same process. I was taking a YAML file or a JSON object, and then I was doing things like you know, okay create the object, modify the object, uh, you know, uh, uh, fetch the object, you know, and then delete at the end. Now that was all redundant for, you know, I could take that same script and, you know, copy it, modify it just a little bit for the different resource types. But uh, the next time what I want to do is I want to use that same pattern and just be able to inject essentially the different uh, YAML or the JSON and then, uh, um, say, you know, this is the path, the JSON path to, uh, you know, validate that, you know, it was updated, uh, that type of a thing. But, uh, but yeah, so it's like, uh, it's always one of those things where it's like, it's never truly done. You know, there's always pretty much something you could do to, uh, you know, make it a little bit more reusable. So... It's almost, yeah. it's also related to the, the question from Chipsaho earlier, right? As he was asking, they were asking um, about why you, you might need to run a test still, even if you have auto scaling. I mean, you were, you were testing something that was in Kubernetes already. So that is one way to do it. Like it doesn't have to be load testing. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I I know you've also done quite a bit of contract testing, right? With using yeah, K six. Exactly. Yeah, and I guess I should have probably showed one of those too. But uh, yeah, and that again, that one's going to be similar to this integration test where it's very uh, procedural. It's just step by step by step by step, and then it's like, okay, thumbs up, you're good to go. Um, but uh, yeah, because it's not 
not a load test. It's you're not going to be sitting there running it against, uh, you know, from a thousand VUs or anything like that. You just need one just to ensure that it's up and running. Yeah, that was a really interesting aha moment for, for me as well, because when I was talking to you and you're like, yeah, I use K6 already then in your previous job, um, but not with load testing. I was like, what? <laughs> Yeah. And now, yeah, it, it's that's the benefit of it, that one tool can be used in three different or more than three different ways. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and that's just like with the synthetic monitoring too, right? So you could use K6 to just basically send off the ping to make sure that, yeah, the system's up. It's, uh, it's, it's running. And in the last one, was it the last one that you did, Marie? with Stefan who who integrated it with Grafana Faro to do RUM. That's yeah. a different kind of test that we didn't even cover here. Yeah, just there's just so many use cases now. And that's like, you know, that's I think I mentioned this as part of our um end of year. <laughs> Pavel, yeah. Uh, yep. Exactly. <laughs> Huh. So Pavel Suala is our CTO. Yeah. <laughs> he says yeah. it's almost like K6 is not a load testing tool, but a reliability testing platform. <laughs> He's such a troll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is becoming that. Um, what are like what what else have we missed? Like, I guess we didn't do any chaos stuff, any disruptor stuff. That would have been interesting too. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Uh, yeah, Pablo. That's he's working on that one. We've had some releases. Uh, there'll be there'll be more content for that coming out soon. I'm yeah. sure. So. Yeah. What about I think what I think what I would like to do or talking about things that we didn't have time to do. What would have been really cool is if we could come up with one script or one test suite for all of these, like different kinds of tests and you know different ways to to use K6, but testing the same application or maybe different aspects of the application. Because mm -hmm. with XK6 Kubernetes, you can do a lot of things that you can do with Kubernetes. Like you can start pods, you can end pods. There's a lot of things that you can do with that too that we didn't cover. Yeah, we definitely need to expand on the demo like, uh, you know, with the socks shop or something or the Crocs yeah. are cool. I think there's a website coming, <laughs> Crocs are cool. Yeah, I wonder what that from. is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but something like that where we can incorporate things like, uh, you know, maybe message queues so then we could mm -hmm. exercise it with XK6 Kafka and, you know, um, yeah. But uh, yeah, some, something massive and then we could start playing around with, oh, there's Pablo. He's, uh, <laughs> if only Our there was some Our are like there. trolls. <laughs> <laughs> they're all they're all coming in i think this yeah. might be all just a6 folks uh on here <laughs> yeah. Pablo's on the he's, he's working on xk6 disruptor we also had him right yeah we we had oh, it uh, yeah we we had him yeah last last month yeah i uh, missed that one since i was out it was for same yeah. uh chris needham also says ideally load testing is just a configuration change I think in some in some ways, yeah, I think that's the dream. It's the dream to have a single test suite and you just like carve it up in different ways and hey, it's a browser end-to-end -end test and hey, now it's a load test. Um, I think in reality, we're not there yet. I think no tool is. I think right now, uh, even, even with K6 being as close as it is, probably the closest one that I know of on the market that has both browser and protocol-based testing, they're still very different. You can't just reuse the browser test and, and expect it to perform the same way that a protocol level test does. But yeah, that's absolutely the dream. It's possible. It'll probably take a lot of resources though. Mm. Yeah, and I just, see that uh, another K6 troll just joined <laughs> on there. Mark, and then uh, you mentioned troll and he comes out. <laughs> Chris, Chris also says XK6 is a huge deal. I can think of a lot of possibilities. Yeah, just to give you an idea, there's an XK6 uh, Minecraft or so I don't know what it's called, but it tests Minecraft servers. <laughs> Yeah. I, <laughs> that was yeah. so interesting when when we saw it. Um, but yeah, it's the benefit of having an open ecosystem where people could just develop whatever they need. 
<laughs> it's also a good reason why not to cram all of this into one tool because any sort of load testing tool that is not performant or like unnecessarily clunky is not yeah. a great performance testing tool. Yeah. Exactly. And then, and then, uh, yeah. And I, Chris, I can't, I can't agree more, um, with, uh, XK six and the whole extensions ecosystem, not just because it keeps me gainfully employed, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I believed is... you until that point. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So, I mean, we have, uh, about, uh, I think it's like over 60 that we know of different extensions. And I mean, yeah, it, it just really makes it, uh, work k6 just all that much more powerful and as we bring in things into the core of k6 we do worry some of the open source developers on there that we're mm -hmm. bloating the uh the core binary but uh you know we only take the ones that are really really necessary and popular so <laughs> yeah can i, right, can I think quickly uh sure. promote just one because we're talking about sure. testing um one of our colleagues who's actually on the chat as well, Pablo. Oh, yeah. So he's going to be one oh, of yeah. the only speaker uh, for the COM42 uh, conference. So this is online, and he's going to talk about how to shift left in terms of chaos testing. So if you want to know more about chaos testing, how you, you know, if you want to know more about our extension XK6 wow. is rock core, then I think, yeah, this is a great um, conference to, uh, to attend. I think this is, yeah, online. Yeah. Yeah, I've signed up for it too. And look who he's with too. He's keeping good company. Yeah. Benjamin Willems, founder of Steadybit, is also someone that we've had on Office Hours. That was also a really interesting um, yeah. show. Nice. Good point, Marie. All right. Well, I think, I think that's it. it for for this week. We did yeah. it. We made it. We survived. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I thank you for, for staying on with us as long as you have, and we will see you next week. Bye-bye. Yeah. Good night, everyone. everybody. I'm going to bed. <laughs>